Emotions are those strong agitations that occur every time we experience the feelings of love or hate, fear or excitement, etc., etc. And whether you realize it or not, these emotions are usually accompanied by certain physical changes, which can be as simple as an increased heartbeat, respiration, or even overt manifestations such as crying or laughing, shaking or screaming. And our emotions not only affect us on a physical level, but they can also affect us on a mental level, which will oftentimes result in a lack of clarity of thought. This would impact our ability to make clear and cogent decisions for our life. For example, a group of researchers have recently discovered that anger will oftentimes augment a sense of personal control, which then lowers the perceptions of risk and ends up making people less willing to admit their mistakes. As a result, the people who oftentimes find themselves filled with the emotions that are caused by anger are also more prone to making really, really bad decisions simply because of their blind pride. The same research went on to reveal that those who experience the emotions that are caused by fear, they tend to second-guess themselves and will oftentimes abandon support for efforts that have gone even slightly off the tracks. As a result, these fear-based emotions will also cause us to make really bad decisions because the fearful person is always second-guessing themselves. They're not so sure of themselves. And they're afraid to be in any sort of confident in themselves. Well, in light of this research, we can see how the emotions that stem from anger and fear or even emotions like excitement and surprise, they can alter the way we think and the way that we react to the various situations that we're faced with on a daily basis. The result is really bad decisions that we soon regret. Thankfully, these bad emotion-driven decisions are easily avoided. Well, they're easily avoided by the Christian who will simply learn how to ignore the emotion commotion raging within themselves and instead focus their minds on the truths of God's Word. Here in our study today, we're going to consider the problems that occur when we slip into that emotion commotion. So if you would, let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel 6 because there we find a group of Israelites They're allowing their emotions to cause the sort of commotion that results in sinful decisions. And as we develop our study today, we'll see how, number one, the emotion commotion will cause cerebral confusion. Number two this morning, we'll see how the emotion commotion also causes biblical revision. And finally today, we'll see how the emotion commotion causes spiritual delusion. With this as our outline, let's begin our study by considering how the emotion commotion, it causes cerebral confusion. If you would look with me there at 1 Samuel 6, beginning at verse 13, there we learn that the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the ark came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the numbers of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Then... He struck the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented, because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? 
So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirjath Jearim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Well, here in our text today, we find the events surrounding the return of the Ark of the Covenant. And as we explore these events, we'll quickly discover that our emotions make for poor decision drivers, and we find that in the example of these Israelites. You see, our emotions, they are the instinctual moods and feelings that spring forth from various experiences, and while the Lord has called us to live according to the truths of His Word, Our emotions, being instinctual, will more than likely lead us to live according to our own carnal nature rather than according to the truths of the Bible. And this is exactly what was happening in the lives of these Israelites here in Beth Shemesh. With this in mind, we should notice again there in verse 13 where we learn that the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Now remember, it was seven months prior to this when the Philistines had defeated the army of Israel and they had captured the Ark of the Lord. And on that day, every Israelite wept as they heard that the glory of God was taken from the tabernacle and lost into the hands of the Philistines. But now, here we are, it's seven months later, and the Ark has mysteriously returned on a cart that was being pulled by two female cows that had just given birth. The Israelites of this small village, they were so filled with emotion that they rejoiced to see the ark of God. I should point out that the word rejoice there in verse 13, it comes from a Hebrew word which speaks of those who have a joyful heart and a cheerful countenance. And from this, we see that the Israelites were on this emotional high. They were so filled with joy that they decided to present the Lord an offering. Look again there at verse 14. There we learn that the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. Large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Here in these verses, we find the people of Beth Shemesh, they're so emotionally charged uh, charged up about this return of the ark that they instantly decided to present the Lord with a burnt offering using the cows that had come there from the land of Philistia. While their heart was probably in the right place, They were probably just so emotionally driven, so emotionally charged, so filled with joy that it's just like, hey, instinct, let's, you know, offer the Lord a sacrifice. But their decision, well, their decision was wrong. And it was just based on emotion and commotion. Now, in order to explain what I mean, hold your place here in 1 Samuel 6 and turn with me to Leviticus chapter 22, because there we find the law surrounding burnt offerings. As you turn to Leviticus 2, I'll remind you that the cows which the people of Beth Shemesh were offering to the Lord in their excitement, they were female cows that had just come from the land of the Philistines. I'll remind you that in our study last week, we learned about the way that the Philistines, they took those two cows that had just given birth, and they used this as a test to see if God's hand was really on it. And they took the calves of these cows away, and they wanted to see if these cows would follow after the sound of their calves or go in the opposite direction towards Israel. And sure enough, those cows took that cart with the ark and the chest and went straight to Israel. But from this, we have to understand that these cows, they shouldn't have been offered to the Lord at all as a burnt offering because, number one, they were the wrong gender. And not only that, but these cows shouldn't have been offered as a burnt offering to the Lord because, number two, They were cows that had come from a foreign land. The reason why I say those things is found here in Leviticus chapter 22. I want to begin there at verse 17, because there we find the Lord speaking to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers his sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his freewill offerings which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering, You shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow, or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. 
those that are blind or broken or maimed, or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb that has any limb too long or too short, you may offer as a freewill offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor shall you make any offering of them in your land. Nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them, and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. Here in these verses we learn that the free will burnt offerings were supposed to be, number one, males. They should have been offering bulls to the Lord at this point. And not only that, but any animal that came from the hand of a foreigner was considered corrupt, defective, and therefore unacceptable in the eyes of the Lord. And so while the joy-filled emotions that the Israelites experienced with the ark's return led these people of Beth Shemesh to offer this burnt offering to the Lord, we also see that their offering was unacceptable because it was the wrong offering. God wasn't receiving this offering from their hands because it wasn't in line with God's word. And from this, we see how easy it is for the emotion commotion that we experience to end up causing cerebral confusion. They just kind of, with all emotion, with all joy, with all excitement, said, let's offer these cows up. And they didn't think for one second that we can't offer these cows up because they're the wrong cows. They're the wrong gender. And they're from a foreigner's hand. As we consider this, we also have to understand how the emotion commotion will cause confusion in our own lives. And so if you would, let's consider this by turning to James chapter 3. Keep your place there at 1 Samuel 6. But turn to James chapter 3. And as you turn to James 3, we should take a moment to consider how our emotional decisions are quite often contrary to the Lord's will. If I could only convince you of that this morning. Because it strikes me as odd that so many Christians think that just because their emotions would lead them, lead them to a certain decision, just because they feel like doing this, or just because they have a desire to do this other thing, they instantly think that, well, this must be God's will. And it's not necessarily true, and quite often it's very contrary to God's will. The reason why is due to the fact that our emotional reactions are typically based on natural feelings. And whenever a person allows their feelings to become their decision drivers, the emotion commotion will usually cause cerebral confusion as we wrestle with that conflict between those things that we want and the things that the Lord wants. Quite often, they're not the same thing. For example, Consider the Christian who begins to feel like they're no longer a good fit for their spouse. And they begin to ask questions like, well, I wonder if God even meant for us to get married in the first place. I can't tell you how many Christians I've heard ask those very questions. Well, I wonder if it was actually God's will for us to be married. And if not, doesn't that mean that we should just get a divorce? I mean, you know, we don't like the same foods. We don't like the same movies. We don't like the same vacation spots. It just doesn't seem like we're a good fit for one another. Certainly, God doesn't want me to be unhappy in marriage. As if God were going to say, yeah, you know, you guys aren't really working out. Go ahead and get a divorce. That's not God's will. On top of that, there are Christian couples. Maybe one of them has met the perfect someone, the soulmate. Maybe at work. And they begin to think, well, certainly God wants me to be happy in marriage, and this person seems to be so cut out just for me. And in their confusion, in their emotional desires, they conclude that God wants them to be happy in marriage, therefore they file for divorce. This is nothing more than an emotion commotion resulting in cerebral confusion so that this person disregards what the Word says, that God is against divorce. Or how about the Christian employee who discovers that they can make more money at work by simply lying to the customers about certain features that their company offers? And while they know that the believe, they, they know that God is against lying, they know that God is against cheating, 
They follow their emotional desire for more money. And in their confusion, they conclude that, well, maybe this is just God's way of providing more money for my family. And it leads them to lie to their customers just for the sake of dishonest gain. How about the Christian who believes that the Lord is leading them to share their faith with a co-worker, and yet they believe that they're probably going to get in trouble if they do, even fired for evangelizing others at work. And though they know they've been called to the great commission of Jesus Christ, their emotional desire to keep their job has caused them to become confused about their mission in Christ. As a result, they just simply fall into the ranks of the other impotent believers who refuse to share their faith at work. I mean, you know, as long as I can keep my job, what does it matter if the rest of these people go to hell? This is nothing more than cerebral confusion that comes from emotional decisions. Without a doubt, I could make a million scenarios up right now where a born-again believer allows their feelings to become an emotion commotion. And listen, though, regardless of the scenario, in every situation, there's always going to be two kinds of Christians. And here this morning, we all fit into one of these two categories. Because there are going to be those who allow their emotion commotion to become cerebral confusion, which results in sinful decisions, And then there's going to be those who allow the emotion commotion to lead them back to God's word so that they might receive the wisdom that they need to make the good and godly decision. This is exactly what James is talking about here in James chapter 3. Look with me there at verse 13. There James asks, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. From this we can see how the Christian who will reign in their self-seeking feelings and envious emotions and seek to make decisions that are based on the perfect wisdom which is found in God's word will then end up living in a way that is pleasing in the sight of God. We will live in a way that is first pure and peaceable, gentle, We'll be willing to yield to one another. We'll be filled with mercy towards one another. We'll be bearing good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. But those who allow their feelings to lead them to, to, to lead them down a path of self-seeking and envy, they'll soon find themselves filled with the confusion that comes from the emotion, commotion resulting in hypocrisy and many evil and sinful decisions. And then the world looks at us and says, see, Christians are hypocrites. They say one thing on Sunday morning, and come Monday, they're doing something different. Nothing but hypocrites. We've got to stop making decisions just based off the emotion, commotion we feel. Based on our own feelings and desires. Because the emotion commotion, it causes cerebral confusion to enter into the lives of those who simply want to follow after their feelings. And not only that, but the emotion commotion also causes biblical revision in the minds of those who really just don't want to follow God's word. You see, when we go to God's word seeking that wisdom, we're going to read things that we didn't want to read. And so what do we do? Well, if we base our decisions off our emotions, then we'll begin to try to explain it away. We'll begin to revise the Bible as if we know better. This brings us to our second point. So if you would, let's turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 6 and consider how the emotion commotion causes biblical revision. Look with me there at verse 15 because there we learn that the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone, Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. 
These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the numbers of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Here in these verses, we learn about the way that the Levites came and they placed the articles which were on that cart onto the stone of Abel, which was there in the field of Joshua, in the field of... uh, Joshua uh, in Beth Shemesh. And after the Levites, they took the ark off of that cart, and they took the chest off of that cart. Then they began to assist the people of Beth Shemesh as they offered sacrifices to the Lord. We see that there in the middle of verse 15, where we find the men of Beth Shemesh offering burnt offerings and making sacrifices on that same day to the Lord. So the same day that the ark arrived is the same day they started offering these sacrifices these sacrifices. And as we've already seen, the emotion commotion of these men, they they were so filled with joy, they were rejoicing and and excited, and and it caused them to offer the wrong sacrifice. In their emotional excitement, these men offered female cows that had come from the land of a foreigner, which was unacceptable in the eyes of the Lord. But not only that, we should also consider how in all of the excitement the emotion and commotion of these men had also caused them to offer the wrong sacrifice in the wrong location. Now, in order to show you how I know this, hold your place here in 1 Samuel 6 and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 12. See, it's in Deuteronomy 12 where we find the Lord. He's commanding the children of Israel to avoid the sacrificial customs of the pagan nations as they entered into the promised land. We have to understand that these pagan nations, they would also offer sacrifices to their false gods, but they would just offer these sacrifices anywhere they wanted to offer them. But the true and living God, he had a very specific place where he wanted the burnt offerings of Israel to be presented, which of course was at the tabernacle. At this point in time, that tabernacle was located in Shiloh. And Shiloh was not Beth Shemesh. With this in mind, consider the instructions that we find here in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Look with me there at verse 1, because there the Lord declares, These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not at all Do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as yet, you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses... In one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command. Here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's directing the children of Israel regarding the right location for their burnt offerings. And he wanted them to avoid just doing whatever they wanted to do. God isn't just saying, hey, just offer your offerings wherever you want. 
doesn't really matter. The stone there in Beth Shemesh, there in that field of Joshua, eh, that's fine. That's cool, whatever you want. No, that's not God's idea of a proper sacrifice, and it's not the right location. He was telling them that there's going to come a day when they enter into the promised land that there's going to be one location, which at this point was at the tabernacle in Shiloh. One location to offer those burnt offerings. And based on this command, we can see then how the emotional excitement of these people, it resulted in a revision of God's word, which at the end of the day was really nothing more than an act of rebellion. And so they're attempting to offer up this this sacrifice to the Lord as this celebration, and it looks spiritual, it looks godly, it looks like the right thing to do, but in fact, it's sin. Because God told them what kind of sacrifice to offer and where to do it. And they weren't following either thing. They were just revising the Bible. They started off following the proper protocol. They had the Levites remove the ark from the cart. And that was a good start, but it wasn't long before they started allowing the emotion commotion to cause these biblical revisions, resulting in the wrong offerings being sacrificed at the wrong location. And if we aren't careful, Christian, please hear me, we too might end up allowing our own emotion commotion to then drive the decisions of how and when we present our offerings to God. Now, in order to explain what I mean by that, hold your place there at 1 Samuel 6 and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As you turn to 2 Corinthians 9, I want to take a moment to gain a proper biblical perspective regarding the sort of financial offerings that Christians have been called to bring before the Lord. You see, we're no longer under the Old Testament law. We live in the age of grace. And the fact is this, there are many pastors out there who are guilty of engaging in biblical revision by placing their people back under the Old Testament law of the tithe. You see, it's under the Old Testament law that the people were required to give a tenth of what they had received. Not so in the New Testament. The tithe is never retaught as a New Testament feature within this age of grace. However, despite the fact of it, every Sunday there are churches where the pastor gets up and starts pounding the pulpit and starts stirring up the emotion commotion amongst their people by using guilt and pressure as a way of convincing people to give that tenth. And you've got to pledge that tenth and you better give more and you've got to give and give and give. That seems like every Sunday the message is about giving. They're not teaching through the Bible. They're teaching you how to reach deep and pull out some, you know, money. But it's just the emotion commotion. This high pressure pitch to raise more and more money is nothing more than an emotion commotion which has resulted in biblical revision. Therefore, I just want to take a moment to consider what the Bible really says about the financial offerings that the Lord has asked us to bring. Look with me there at 2 Corinthians 9. Now, concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart." not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. It doesn't say that God loves a giver of 10%. It doesn't say that God loves a person who was browbeat into opening up their wallet and giving something. No, it says that God loves a cheerful giver. And here in these verses, we find a proper New Testament perspective on our financial gifts and offerings. And rather than pointing to the Old Testament law of the tithe, Paul simply declared each person should just give as he purposes in his heart. 
not grudgingly, not out of necessity, not because someone shook a bag in your face before the Bible study started and you felt like, oh, if I don't give something, then we don't even do that here. We don't want grudge money. We don't want guilt money. We don't want you to check a box and say, well, I gave a couple of dollars, so I must be right with God. No. That's not an offering that is pleasing to the Lord. God loves a cheerful giver. And he promises that those who give generously will reap generously in whatever blessings the Lord chooses. With this in mind, we have to understand that Giving in this age of grace has less to do with the amount that we give and more to do with the heart of the giver. That being the case, any pastor who attempts to convince you to give more and more with some sort of emotion, commotion of guilt, they're only engaging in biblical revision by trying to convince you that it's necessary for you to give a tithe if you want to be right with God. It's not what the New Testament tells us. And I would encourage every Christian here you know, if you're just visiting this morning and you go to a church where you're getting pounded with the message of tithing week after week, I would leave that church in a heartbeat because that pastor is engaging in biblical revision. And while the emotion commotion that causes biblical revision regarding financial offerings can come from the pulpit, we also have to understand that there can be a lot of biblical revision surrounding this topic of, of giving happening amongst lay leaders and even parishioners as well. Now, in order to explain what I mean, continue holding your place there at 1 Samuel 6. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. And as you turn to Acts 4, I want to take a moment to consider the emotional tug, the the emotional draw that we feel whenever we're asked to give our money to the various charities and organizations of this world. For example, just to relay my own story here, I, I was at a local pharmacy purchasing a few things. And as I was checking out the cashier, she asked me if I wanted to give a dollar towards this charity that they were endorsing Would you like to give a dollar for this thing <coughs> at that point in time my mind began to reel from the emotion commotion you know and I'm sitting there going oh man I mean you know I come in here often every time I'm being asked to give more money and and while there's a part of me that's just like well yeah I, I don't mind supporting this thing but it's just like how much money do I have in the bank to be able to come here every single time and, and, and give a dollar if every time I'm just emotionally driven to make this decision, next thing I know, I, I'm going to be out on the streets begging for money. Or in the pulpit saying, got to give your tenth. <laughs> so my heart was telling me to give that dollar. I mean, what's a dollar? But then it's just kind of like, every single time I'm asked for money, do I have to give it? Just because some emotion in me stirs and I just have this passion to help them, but can I? Do I have the money to do it? The fact is, this same exact emotion commotion occurs every time a person tugs at our heartstrings and asks us to give that money, whether we're on the side of the road and that person is just standing there saying, sure, I'm hungry, and the heart is, oh, I just want to help this person, or maybe we're, you know, at the grocery store being asked to donate a little money towards that charity, and the emotions are stirred, and we're just struggling with whether to give or not. As a result, there are many Christians who allow this emotion commotion to result in biblical revision. And in order to explain what I mean by that, we must first consider what the New Testament model is for Christian giving, which is clearly presented here in an example found in Acts chapter 4. Look with me there at verse 32. There Luke tells us that the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Here in these verses, we find the Christians of the early church, they're presenting their financial offerings to the leaders there at church. And and don't misunderstand this. It's not suggesting that a person who owned a house sold their house and gave the money to the church. It's not what it says there. 
What were being told is those who had excess land, those who had land they didn't need, the, those who had things that they were just sitting on and, and they weren't using, they, they sold those things. They sold their excess. They, they, they made sure that those who were in their church had, if they had not before. And those who had too much, they made sure that they were the ones providing. You see, they trusted in the leaders of their church to take that money and use it for the glory of God and for the benefit of other believers within their Christian community. And much like the Lord told the Israelites to not just offer their burnt offerings in any old place, but there at the tabernacle, I believe that the Lord is showing us here that he would have Christians to present their financial offerings to the leadership of their church so that the Lord can then direct the leaders of that church in how to use that money for the benefit of that community, as well as for the glory of God. And in this way, the leadership that the Lord has raised up, they, they use that money to help meet the needs of people there in the church and support the work of ministry. And this is not only true for the financial offerings collected for the local church, but it's also true of the offerings that were raised for missions support. You can turn and read this later, but it's found in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Paul declares, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. From this we see that the Bible presents us with plain and simple instructions to take up a collection each and every Sunday, which is not only used to support that, that local church, but also believers abroad. You know, maybe there's a church that uh, the Lord puts on our heart. Certainly there was the church in Jerusalem that was on Paul's heart, and he was leading the church there in Galatia and Corinth to collect money in support of those believers back in Jerusalem. And those collections would be taken up on the first day of the week, or Sunday, when the church was meeting. Unfortunately, there are many Christians who allow the emotion commotion regarding our offerings to cause a biblical revision in our minds so that either we don't give anything at all or, or giving things to charities that are beyond the church because, well, I, I'm not really so sure that the leaders of my church are really going to do the right thing with this money. And so I'd rather just direct it to where I think it needs to go. And that's how I give. But that's not really what we find in the Bible. What we find in the Bible is an allocation of money where it's consolidated within the church so that the leaders can then use that money both at home and abroad. Now, as we consider all these verses on New Testament giving, we discover that the church is supposed to meet together on the first day of the week, collect an offering, which is then used by the leaders to accomplish ministry, both home and abroad. Therefore, as the pastor of this church, I'm not here to stir up your emotions. I'm not here to pound the pulpit and put you back under the law and tell you to give a tithe. And No, I'm not going to do that because that's not the kind of money that I want this church to be built upon. But I am called to teach you what the Bible says is true so that any biblical revisions that we've created because of some emotional stirring, we can get rid of that and say, this is what the Bible teaches us, this is what we're going to do. And so God loves a cheerful giver. I pray that this church would be filled and continue to be filled with cheerful givers who believe that the Lord can direct the leadership of this church to use those financial offerings in a way that glorifies him and benefits believers here at home and abroad. And in this way, we can avoid the biblical revisions that are caused by our own emotion, commotion surrounding financial offerings. So we see then that the emotion, commotion, it causes cerebral confusion in the lives of those who are following after their feelings. The emotion, commotion causes biblical revision in the minds of those who would rather just give what they want where they want. But finally, we should consider how the emotion, commotion also causes spiritual delusion in the hearts of those who don't respect God's word. Now, in order to explain what I mean, let's turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 6. I want to begin there at verse 19, because there we learn that God struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,000 and 70 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, 
Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirjath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Here in these verses, we find a group of Israelites who they went one step further in their disregard for God's word. Because in their excitement, they not only decided to present the wrong offering in the wrong location, but they ended up crossing over this final boundary by removing the mercy seat from the Ark of the Covenant so that they could look inside and see what was there. It's possible that their heart was just to check the contents, to make sure that everything was still there, to make sure that the Philistines hadn't stolen anything out of the Ark. They wanted to make sure that the rod of Aaron was there, that the, that the jar of manna and, and the tablets of the law were still housed within Unfortunately for them, what they failed to recognize is that they didn't have the right to go beyond the mercy seat. They didn't have the right to look in that ark. You see, according to the law of God, it was the sons of Kohath from the tribe of Levi who were called to take a veil and wrap it around the, tavern, uh, t- around the ark. They were to take that veil from the tabernacle and wrap the ark with it whenever they moved it from place to place. And this way, the glory of God would be contained within the ark, thereby sparing the lives of those who were still unholy. Therefore, when these guys removed the mercy seat, they were literally blown away by the glory of God. Just think Raiders of the Lost Ark. Their faces melted and all that kind of stuff happened. Now, our English translation tells us here that the Lord struck 50,070 men of the people. However, This isn't actually the best translation of the original Hebrew. As a matter of fact, commentator Robert Jameson, he writes this, Beth Shemesh being only a village, this translation must be erroneous and should be, he smote 50 out of 1,000, being only 1,400 in all who indulged in the curiosity. Pastor David Guzik also argues that the manuscript evidence is pretty clear that the number recorded originally in the text was 70, not 50,070 men, So he goes on to explain here that the Hebrew grammar can mean that out of 50,000 men, God struck 70 of them. So from the research of these guys, we see how the Lord probably claimed the lives of about 50 to 70 men. And the reason why is due to the fact that, consider for a second, the minute I turn on the light, darkness is just gone. Darkness cannot exist where there is light. In the same way, sinners cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. And as his glory came out of that ark, sinners couldn't exist. Not without the mercy seat. You see, that mercy seat was there for a reason. It was God's grace saying, this mercy seat will keep you from being destroyed by God's glory. And so in the midst of all the emotional excitement, this handful of guys, they decided to remove the mercy seats. They decided to go toe-to-toe with God's glory, and they lost. They were operating under the delusion that they had the liberty to stand in the presence of God's glory apart from his merciful grace. And from this, we should take some time to consider how Like them, our emotion commotion can lead us into the delusion that we have more liberties before God than we really do. With that, if you would, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. And as you turn to Galatians 5, I want to talk a little bit about our perceived liberties because much like the people of Beth Shemesh, I often hear Christians today talking about all the liberties they have in the Lord. And yet, a lot of those conversations, to me, it sounds like nothing more than just a license to sin. I have this liberty and that liberty. And and all they're really talking about are things that God is saying, no, don't do that. Well, if God says don't do it, then there's no liberty to do it. That's just license to sin. For example, several several years ago, there was a young couple who attended here very briefly. And when they showed up, they were engaged to be married, and and they sought me out for premarital counseling, which I was happy to provide them with. But in, in the beginning of our premarital counseling, what I found out is that they were actually living together. They were engaging in premarital cohabitation. 
at that point in time, I, I showed them both what the Bible says about premarital cohabitation and how they need to go ahead and separate their living situation until after the wedding. On wedding day, now you can move in. But until then, don't go there. Unfortunately, they got very upset, angry with me. And from their own emotion commotion, they followed a path of delusion. And that decision to leave Calvary South Austin and just go somewhere else where their so-called liberty would be accepted was nothing more than a delusional decision. However, much like those men in Beth Shemesh, this couple was really just operating under this delusion that their liberty was uh, approved by God when the word of God actually reveals that it's not approved by God. This is just one of, of many stories where Christians decide that some liberty they have, some, some liberty that they're exercising is okay with God even though God's word says something different. It's just illusion. And in similar fashion, the Christians of Galatia, they were also struggling to understand the difference between license and liberty. And therefore, in Galatians 5, looking there at verse 13, Paul encouraged them by writing, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. From this, we see that our liberties should always be curbed by our responsibility to serve one another. And in support of this view, Peter also revealed in 1 Peter 2.16 that while every believer is free, we still shouldn't use our liberties as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Think about it like this. A person who's a Christian is a person who has received the grace of God which is found at the mercy seat of Jesus Christ. And when we receive that grace by faith at the mercy seat of Jesus Christ, we've been set free from the bondage of the law. We've been liberated from our sinful nature so that we can serve God and his people. That's what our liberty is for. The freedom to live in the way that God wants us to. But then if a Christian decides to make an emotionally driven decision to use that freedom to return to their sinful ways, well, they're no longer walking in their freedom. They're just returning to their bondage. You see, I had the liberty to be a drunk before I became a Christian. The Lord's liberty didn't set me free so I could continue to be a drunk. His liberty has set me free so that I don't have to be a drunk. I, was a, I had the freedom to be a drug addict before I was a Christian. The Lord's liberty hasn't liberated me so that I can continue to be a drug addict. No, his liberty has set me free from the bondage of drugs so that I no longer have to do drugs. This is what the Lord's liberty is all about. And the Christian who thinks that their liberty gives them the right to go beyond the mercy seat and try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God's glory and live any old way they want to is living in spiritual delusion. And if this sounds like you this morning, Christian, then repent. And recognize that where there's light, there's no darkness. Our liberty, our freedom has been given to us so that we can become the bond servants of God so that we can serve one another. That being the case, I want to encourage every Christian here to stop making emotionally based decisions just because it feels good, just because it's what you want, just because it thought you thought, hey, that sounds neat, it doesn't make it God's will for you. It just doesn't. And more than often, it's probably not God's will for you. We must stop making emotionally based decisions because our emotions are typically based on the natural instincts of our carnal nature. And as a result, those who are driven by their own emotion commotion will suffer from the cerebral confusion that occurs in the lives of those who are following after their own feelings. Not only that, but those who are driven by their own emotion, commotion, will also begin to make biblical revisions 
so that we can start dismissing what God's word clearly says and try to interpret it in some way that you know, lines up with more of what we want. And those who are driven by their own emotion, commotion will experience the spiritual delusion that happens in the hearts of those who begin to use their liberty as a license to sin. Therefore, rather than allowing our emotions to drive every decision that we make, let's allow the truths of God's word to lead us into biblically based decisions so that we might serve one another as the bondservants of God, because this is how we avoid the emotion commotion. 